Tim for the introduction. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Uh, I think the three of us are really excited to be here this morning to tell you a little bit about our research. Uh, so as Tim mentioned, uh, my name is Veronica Pollack and I'm a senior grad student in Jennifer Ogilvie's group in the phys physics department. Um, I have a little bit of a cold this morning, so apologies if I have to take a break to cough. Um, but I'm going to be telling you a little bit this morning about uh, our work studying photosynthesis using ultrafast spectroscopy. So uh, just to let everyone know ahead of time, the demo that I'm going to be using is going to be using a strobe light. I'll let everyone know ahead of time uh, before I use it uh, so that uh, if you need to take care of something, please do. Okay. All right, so photosynthesis uh, is, a, is a fairly familiar process. Uh, we know it as the, the, a series of chemical reactions where plants uh, take carbon dioxide and water and use sunlight to create carbohydrates. So it's a conversion process of energy absorbed from the sun into a long-term chemical energy. Uh, and uh, another, another byproduct of plant photosynthesis is oxygen. Uh, and we associate photosynthesis with this green color that we see in plants. Uh, and this is primarily, so the green color in plants is primarily due to a light-absorbing molecule called chlorophylls uh, that is really prominent in these uh, in these organisms, uh, but there are a variety of photosynthetic organisms on Earth, uh, and they come in a variety of colors. Uh, so here uh, uh, on the right, I'm showing um, on the top a, a type of bacteria that looks purple, and on the bottom, there's several different types of bacteria, and these are um, these utilize different, slightly different molecules um, with different spectral properties, and they're really attuned to uh, their environment. So they live in, in conditions different from plants with different light conditions, different acidic conditions, different temperatures. Uh, but they do photosynthesis in a very similar way to plants, so taking in carbon dioxide and using sunlight uh, to generate carbohydrates. Um, but these organisms, they're all really well suited to the environments they live in and really optimized to uh, harness uh, energy from the light that they absorb uh, and convert it into a, sort, uh, a form that's really usable by them. So photosynthesis, uh, I get, whenever I tell people that I study photosynthesis, uh, people generally say, oh, well, don't we know everything about uh, photosynthesis? Uh, and the truth is that there are a lot of unexplored, uh, there are a lot of unanswered questions in photosynthesis. Uh, so here on the right, I'm showing just a few different kind of fundamental questions that we still are asking uh, about the process. And on the right, there are a, a wide variety of uh, projects where people are trying to apply what we know about photosynthesis or what we're learning about photosynthesis um, to different uh, aspects of fuel production uh, and uh, design of different uh, devices. In our group, we focus primarily on energy and charge transfer processes in photosynthesis. Uh, so these are the steps that immediately follow the absorption of light by either a plant or a photosynthetic bacteria. Uh, so it's the, the first process that takes that absorbed energy and, and initially converts it into a form of chemical energy. Uh, and one of the reasons that we're interested in this process is because it has potential applications to uh, the design of artificial uh, solar light energy harvesting devices. Um, so uh, in these early steps where uh, light is initially absorbed by these organisms, uh, it takes place in this kind of architecture uh, demonstrated by the schematic. So there are a large number of high energy absorbing molecules. So blue is a high, higher energy than a, a red uh, photon. And they uh, need to rapidly transfer that energy in a downhill energy uh, scheme. Uh, and so in most photosynthetic organisms, they transfer this energy down to a low energy state that exists in the reaction center. It's a, it's a complex called the reaction center. Uh, so uh, this is a, a schematic of uh, what a system might actually look like. 
uh, in purple uh, photosynthetic bacteria. So there are, um, so these, uh, these light absorbing pigments are inside of these protein complexes inside of a membrane, uh, and they're arranged in such a way that there are, on the perimeter of this um, complex, there are a lot of these uh, high energy light absorbing uh, molecules. Uh, and what they do is they're going to absorb sunlight and rapidly transfer it between each other until that energy uh, reaches one of two reaction centers in the center of this complex. So this thing acts like a, an energy funnel, uh, absorbing uh, higher energy light and moving it down into the center, into lower energy states. Uh, so this is a structure of uh, the complex that I study most closely uh, in the Ogilvy group. It's called the reaction center. and so. Um, this is a protein complex. Uh, in the gray is showing the, the protein, the alpha helices, uh, and inside are embedded these light absorbing uh, pigments, uh, and these pigments are arranged in a really precise way so that the, the electronic and the vibrational properties of these molecules are really tuned uh, to uh, function as rapidly as possible. And so after uh, light energy is transferred into this reaction center, the ultimate step that takes place is the uh, separation of an electron. Uh, so once that energy uh, reaches the low energy state, uh, it generates a charge separation and the uh, electron it gets separated out. And this happens on ultra fast time scales. Uh, and so this is a, a really interesting process because um, one of the main issues facing artificial uh, photovoltaic design is really getting the charge away as, as efficiently as possible. Um, so these, uh, the charge separation steps are ultra fast, uh, but the recombination steps uh, where the electron is recombining with the positive charge take place on uh, 10 to 100 times slower time scales. And the result uh, in these systems is that for nearly, 100, uh, for nearly every photon that is absorbed by this reaction center, uh, we'll get this charge separation happening. So it's about 100% efficient in that process. And that's really interesting, we'd really like to understand how, uh, how this happens, how this system is able to do that. Um, but in order to study it, we need ultra-fast time scales. So we need a, an instrument that can measure on the time scale that these processes are happening. And we do that using ultra-fast spectroscopy. So just to orient everyone uh, what ultra-fast time scales are, where we are in time. So here's um, just a, a, a chart of uh, the different time scales starting from a second and smaller. Um, and so ultra-fast generally refers to events that are 100 picoseconds or shorter. So a picosecond is a trillionth of a second. Uh, we also care about femtoseconds, and those are a quadrillionth of a second. And so these are really unrelatable time scales because we live on the uh, millisecond, which is like the blink of an eye, uh, millisecond to second to days to years. Um, so it's really hard to, to think about just how fast these are, um, but something that is kind of helpful is thinking about the distance that uh, light can travel on those time scales. So light is the fastest thing we know about. And in a second, uh, light is able to move uh, a distance equal to three-fourths of the way from the Earth to the moon. Uh, but in a picosecond, light has only moved four widths of a human hair. Uh, so these are really, really fast events and uh, oh, pushing like towards the fundamental, uh, some fundamental limits of uh, light, uh, spec like visible light spectroscopy here. Uh, so just a little bit about spectroscopy. So one of the most basic types of spectroscopy we can do uh, is absorption spectroscopy. So we have some, uh, a beam, some light source, and it's incident on a detector. It's not an eye, uh, but this is the, the typical symbol used for detectors. Um, and we can look at the, um, the amplitude of this spectrum as a function of frequency on the, the graph on the right. If we want to look at some sample and look at the, the properties of some sample, we can stick it in the beam and see where the transmittance has changed. So if we see a dip in the transmittance, uh, that's where the, the sample is absorbed. And if we uh, compare the two spectra with and without the sample, we can get an absorption spectrum. And this is a really useful tool for figuring out where samples are interacting with light, uh, but it doesn't tell us anything about time dependence in our samples. So in order to look at the time dependence, uh, we can start using pulsed light. And so if we use uh, a type of time-dependent spectroscopy that utilizes two uh, pulses of light with some time delay, we can look at how 
the absorbance um, changes uh, with this time delay. So the, the first pulse, the pump, will excite our system to some state. We'll wait some time t, uh, and then have the, the second pulse, the probe, interact with our sample, and we'll watch how the how the change in the changes in the how the probe is interacting with our sample. Um, so by doing this type of spectroscopy, um, we can see uh, uh, where trans transitions are decaying. We might be able to learn something about uh, energy transfer or coupling between transitions. Um, and one of the, the really important aspects of any time-resolved spectroscopy uh, is time resolution. Uh, and the really the rate-limiting thing in, a, in our uh, spectroscopy is the temporal pulse width. Um, so needing to have as short uh, pulses as possible. All right, so I'm going to move to my demo, uh, where I'm going to be using a strobe light. I'll be describing it uh, verbally so people who are able to watch can hopefully get a sense of what's happening. So, OK. All right, so I have this double pendulum. So there's uh, these two hinges. Uh, and before I, we turn the lights off, I'm going to let it go. And we can see that this pendulum has several different time scales of motion happening, right? There's this overall back and forth. And then there's this really fast dynamics at this hinge in the center. Um, so if we're trying to do a, uh, an experiment where we're trying to understand, um, we don't know anything about the system initially. Uh, we're going to do like a stroboscopic experiment on this. Um, can we get the lights off? Okay. So if I start with a low time resolution experiment, I can see that, lo that slower time scale, this overall back and forth. But there's a lot that I'm not able to see um, until I increase the time resolution. And I can start to see these fast dynamics in addition to those slow dynamics at the same time. So in order to really properly, uh, in order to really properly um, understand uh, what's happening in a system, we need to be able to resolve all of the time scales at the same time. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is uh, going back to the, the bacterial reaction center. So the structure, again, is on the right. But this time, I'm, I'm now labeling some of the pigments. Uh, it's not important to know what the labels are, uh, but I just wanted to point out uh, that um, so on the left here, I've got the, linear, the absorption spectrum, so similar to the, the first spectroscopy that I talked about. And we can see that there are several prominent, uh, we call these bands, these peaks. And we know a lot about this system. We don't know everything. Um, but we know a little bit, we, so we know uh, we can generally assign um, which of these molecules on the right are contributing to which of these bands. Um, and so this is really helpful uh, when we're trying to understand the dynamics of the system. Um, and nowadays, we can uh, fairly easily ha uh, get an ultra-fast laser. So here I'm showing uh, the spectrum in frequency for a commercially purchased uh, 35 femtosecond pulse laser. So that's really fast. So we're getting really close to the time scales that we need. But if we look at the, the spectrum, we're only able to really cover one of these bands. Uh, and we really want to be able to cover as much of, the, of, of, of much of the absorption spectrum at the same time as possible. And so what we end up doing is we spend a lot of time uh, developing uh, light sources uh, that take this, this 35 femtosecond pulse light in orange um, and broaden it, uh, broaden it in the spectrum uh, and shorten it in time. So this purple spectrum that I'm showing now is one of the, one, from one of the light sources that we've developed in our lab. And so we can cover nearly all of these transitions at the same time. And it, it, it gives us about a 10 femtosecond pulse width. So that's getting really close, to, really there on the time dynamics that we need. And so this is a, a, a long term uh, an image of one of these light sources uh, just to show you uh, kind of what the lab looks like. Uh, so you can see some beams jogging around in the background. But so we end up, uh, when we're doing experiments, we spend the majority of our time tuning these light sources. All right, so back to uh, our time-dependent spectroscopy. So now we've got the, the, broadband the broadband spectra that we need and the short time resolution that we need. Uh, but this type of spectroscopy still leaves a lot of ambiguity uh, in these systems that have a lot of different states. 
Um, so instead, we use a type of spectroscopy called two-dimensional electronic spectroscopy. And so it's very similar to the, to the previous time-resolved spectroscopy. So we've got a pump and a probe, except that we introduce a second pump, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Um, and we still scan this time delay T, which allows us to watch how the system is evolving with time. Uh, but this, having the second pump allows us to detect an, an additional axis of, uh, of excitation. So now uh, our experiment, we can look at the excitation frequency, the detection frequency, and how the system is evolving with time. And so if we had a system where we had, um, if we had some solution, we didn't know very much about it. So let's say that there are, we see these two peaks in the absorption spectrum. We think that there are two molecules, but we don't know anything else. If we look at a 2D spectrum uh, shown on the right here, um, if we see peaks uh, which are at, along this diagonal line, the diagonal line corresponding to excitation equals detection frequency, which means that the system hasn't uh, changed over time, we can say that um, these peaks correspond to uh, the transitions of these individual molecules. And if we look at the time dependence and don't see any, uh, we just see these peaks decay, uh, we can say that these are uncoupled systems. They're just two molecules hanging out in the same solution, not talking to each other. Um, and we can just watch how they decay over time. But if we have a system where these uh, molecules are coupled, um, we can see evidence for energy transfer uh, in peaks that are off of that diagonal line. And so peaks off of that diagonal line below it correspond to a downhill energy transfer. So energy being transferred from a higher energy molecule to a lower energy molecule. So here's some data from, um, for our bacterial reaction center showing you the, linear, or the absorption spectrum on the left, again, for reference. Um, so on the right is a, a 2D spectrum, so we have uh, excitation frequency on the x-axis, detection frequency on the y-axis, and I've banded out uh, where these different peaks are for you on the, um, the 2D map, and we can watch how this uh, system uh, evolves with time, so the time axis is in the top, uh, top of that 2D plot. And if we look at the peaks, uh, we can see evidence for downhill energy transfer. Uh, so the yellow being from uh, energy transfer from these molecules labeled H to molecules labeled B, and then the orange from uh, molecules B to P. And then we can also see energy transfer all the way down from H to P. And then if we uh, wait longer, uh, so that's en downhill energy transfer. And if we wait longer, we can see evidence for uh, this charge transfer process happening. Um, and so using this technique, we've been able to, to resolve with uh, uh, better certainty uh, what the pathway is that this energy transfer is taking, what the time scales are for that, and then also uh, where the charge separation is happening. Um, and so if we run through that, so energy is rapidly transferred uh, within a few hundred femtoseconds down to uh, these states labeled P, and then the electron is uh, relatively slowly, so it's picoseconds, but you know, 100 times slower uh, is relatively slowly moved uh, down one of these branches. So this is a pretty new result. Um, so just to, to wrap up, uh, so we, we use broadband spectral pulses with, with short time uh, duration uh, to look at these ultra-fast processes in photosynthesis. And uh, we're getting closer to understanding these systems and, and you know, really hoping to develop some design principles to, to apply to making more efficient uh, devices. Um, so thank you for... Uh, being here and listening to me, I uh, want to thank the Demo Lab and Tim Chupp. And if you were interested in any of the stuff I talked about today, uh, there are several uh, previous Saturday morning physics talks, hour long, that you should check out. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Veronica. These very exciting results, I believe that on the physics department website just in the last day or two, uh, there's an article that describes uh, more of this work. It just appeared in a very prestigious science journal, Science. All right, our next speaker is uh, Brian, um, who will tell us about sound heard around the world. Excellent. Thank you so much for that introduction.
Alrighty, so uh, today I want to talk to you about physics. No particular surprise there. But the word physics means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, some people think of physics on the large scale, so like universe or galaxies or uh, dark matter, dark energy, gravity waves, uh, or on the much smaller scale, like particle physics, Higgs boson, quantum mechanics, or things merging the two, like string theory. Um, instead, I want to talk to you about my field, uh, which is not on the large or the small scale, but is on the sort of the human scale. Uh, and that's acoustics. Um, and specifically, I want to talk about uh, ocean acoustics, which is my research field, uh, so the science of underwater sound. Um, and so rather than talking to you about my own research, uh, I want to talk to you about um, some really awesome stuff that I, that, um, I found out about in my field um, that I haven't seen really published, or not published, but haven't seen advertised uh, that well uh, beyond, beyond papers, beyond academic papers. So, uh, that's what I want to talk to you today about, and sort of the fundamental question that we're sort of building up to is how far does sound travel? How far can it travel? So we're used to things on the order of feet or yards even, maybe even miles for some really loud sounds, right? But not too much farther than that usually. Um, but what I wanted to know is can we get sound to travel around the world, um, which requires tens of thousands of miles? That's, that's what we're going to be building up to today. Uh, but in order to get there, we've got to answer a more fundamental question of what is sound? Um, so to answer that, let's use this little schematic here. Each of these little dots is supposed to represent a molecule or an atom um, in some medium. So it could be air or water, uh, whatever you like. And what we're going to do is we're going to give the molecules along the left-hand side a kick, and those molecules are going to bump into the ones next to them, and, and so on and so forth, um, producing this sort of chain reaction. Um, and so this is the phenomenon of sound. This is how sound works. You give molecules a kick, they bump into each other, and that disturbance propagates down. Um, so that's what sound is. So returning to the question of how far sound travels, there's roughly three separate reasons for sound traveling, or limiting the distance sound can travel. So mathematically, sound travels infinitely far, right? But at some point, you can no longer hear it, and then at some point beyond that, you can just no longer measure it, even with the best equipment. Um, and so the first limiting factor is background noise. So if you've ever been in you know, a cocktail party, for example, you can't hear anyone across the room because there's just too much noise going on. But if everyone was gone, you'd be able to hear them perfectly easily. So that's the first limiting effect is background noise. Uh, the next one is attenuation, which you can think of sort of as sound friction. Um, that m largely doesn't matter on the sort of time scales we're, or distance scales that we're used to with sound. But on very large scales, it starts to matter. Um, and then the final one, the main one that uh, I want to talk about is spreading losses. So spreading losses, to illustrate that a little bit more, it's sort of like a sphere um, getting larger and larger. So as I talk, for example, um, there's a finite amount of energy coming out of my mouth and going into the air molecules sur immediately surrounding my mouth, right? Um, and then those molecules are going to spread out in sort of a hemisphere around my mouth. Um, and so the amount of energy per area, which is basically the volume, is going to be very loud up close, but then quieter and quieter as it spreads away, because there's the same amount of energy over a much larger area. Um, and so it works out that the loudness is going to scale with 1 over r squared, 1 over the distance squared, uh, or the inverse square law. Um, and so more intuitively, that basically means that for sound to travel 10 times the distance, it gets 100 times quieter. Um, so that's, that's what we're used to in everyday life. Um, so I want to make this plot here. I'm going to show a couple of these plots. It's going to be distance traveled horizontally and volume traveled, or I'm sorry, volume of the source in decibels. Um, and so the blue line is going to be for a given source volume, how far does it travel before it's just sort of buried in the background noise and you can no longer hear it. Um, and so that's, that's what the blue line uh, indicates. And so the constituents of that blue line are these. So the, the gray is the background noise. Um, the orange is the spreading loss, and red is attenuation. And so let's actually put some numbers to this. So the horizontal axis is going to be logarithmic. So what that means is every uh, unit there you see is a factor of 10. So we've got from 1 meter all the way up to 100,000 kilometers. Um, and on the vertical scale, we've got decibels, with 40 decibels being uh, background noise, sort of in like a living room or something like that. Um, so moving up here, so we've got 60 decibels. That's about speaking volume. So the way this graph works is you find 60 decibels vertically, follow it over to the blue line, and then drop a line down, and see where that hits. And so that hits about 10 meters, or about 30 feet. So that seems about reasonable. Much more than 30 feet at normal speaking volume uh, is about as far as you're going to be able to hear someone. Um, yelling, that's about 90 dB. So you can imagine that if someone's yelling, you might be able to hear them as, may, as many as like two or three football fields away. Um, probably not much more than that. Um, Fireworks, those are quite loud. This is particularly those, uh, those loud bang, just, they're, all, they're all just flash. 
uh, no, no actual colors. Those ones are very loud. Those are 145 decibels, um, which again on this graph shows that it's about 15 miles you can hear that way. So that's about the next town over that it would just barely be audible to you, um, but not much more. And so, all right, what's, how much louder can we get? So what's about the loudest thing we can think of? Well, the one I thought of is an atomic bomb. Um, so an atomic bomb is 240 decibels. Uh, and you follow that over on the graph, we only get 100 miles, um, which is 100 miles pretty far, right, in terms of sound. But um, it's not tens of thousands of miles. So the question is, how are we going to get to tens of thousands of miles if atomic bombs only get us to 100? So to answer that question, we've got to go into the ocean. Um, so here's my little schematic for the ocean. Uh, the bottom is, uh, you see like a little sandy bottom here, sort of a cross section. Uh, at the top, we've got a nice sunny day. And we've got this nice blue ocean, all at constant temperature and pressure. And we pop a little acoustic source here. Uh, I should mention that the sound speed in this environment is one mile per second. So it's about four and a half times faster than it is in air. Um, but that doesn't really affect how far it travels uh, necessarily. Well, anyway, uh, so sound comes out of here, comes out of the source, and goes out in all directions. It bounces off the tops and the bottoms and just continues in all sorts of directions. But the problem is that when it bounces off the top of the bottom, you lose a lot of volume. It's sort of like yelling into a pillow, if you will. The bottom and the top, for a variety of reasons, are very absorptive and do not reflect sound very, uh, very well. And so even in this environment, if we were to redo those plots, what we'd find is that the attenuation is much lower, which is good news for getting farther travel. Um, but the surface and bottom being lossy don't really help us all that much. And so the net result is we do improve how far sound can travel, but not nearly anything close to tens of thousands of miles. Um, so very, very marginal improvement. So how are we going to do this? Well, the one thing I swept on the rug here is that this is the idealized ocean. Um, had I been looking at a real deep ocean, which is about three miles deep for sort of center of the ocean, sort of ocean basin scales. Um, so three miles deep. Now we get, um, so it's cold sort of in the center. No particular surprise there. Uh, near the surface, it's warm, relatively warm. I still wouldn't want to go swimming. But it's warmer because the sun's heating it up, of course. And near the bottom, it's still cold, but it's now the water molecules are under significant pressure. It's 500 atmospheres down there. Um, and so what that means in terms of sound speed is uh, at the cold, that's going to be slow. That's sort of our base case scenario. Um, in the warmer stuff, the molecules are moving around faster, right? So they bump into each other faster, meaning that the sound will travel faster. Um, and in the, in, the lower, in the lower part of the ocean, at the higher pressure, the water molecules are squeezed together tighter, and so now they have less distance to travel in order to, to transmit sound. And so this fast, slow, fast thing is going to turn out to be really important for understanding how sound can travel uh, such large distances. And so anytime you have sound traveling at different speeds, there's a phenomenon that appears called refraction, which is the bending of sound. And so to sort of give a bit of an illustration for what that means, um, imagine we have a gradient of material here going from fast to slow. Um, and we have our molecules again. And we give the molecules along the left edge a kick. And what happens is, Along the bottom, they're traveling very slowly, whereas across the top, they're moving quite quickly. Right? But we can see the overall sort of net effect is that the sound starts to bend, right? sort of starting to bend downwards, sort of following this arrow. So we'll see that one more time. So that's sound bending towards the slower medium. This is refraction. So now let's flip it. Now we're going to go the other way around. We have slow at the top, fast at the bottom. Um, throw our molecules up there, and we give them a kick. And we see the opposite happens. Now it starts bending upwards, again, towards the slower medium. One more time. So what we learned is sound bends towards the slower medium. So let's go back to this picture here. What happens is sound that comes out of that source is going to go up towards the faster medium and then get bent back down towards the slower. And then once it hits the slower medium, then it's going to hit the faster medium at the bottom again and turn back up. And you get this sort of uh, trapped phenomenon happening here. And so to illustrate that a little bit better, I've got an awesome demo prepared for me by the physics demo lab. Um, where is the little, ha right where I needed it. Um, okay, so here's what we've got. We've got um, an inclined plane, more or less. Um, this red stripe here is felt. This is supposed to represent the slow material. And on the sides here, we have foam, which is supposed to represent the fast material. And for um, for sound, what we're using is, hopefully you can see it, yeah, here we go. It is basically just two wheels on an axle. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take this thing, and we're going to roll it down uh, the inclined plane here and see what happens. If we roll it straight down, it's just going to roll straight down, no big surprises. But if we roll it at an angle here, see what happens. 
It curves. Oh, I almost got a fourth. Okay, so I'm going to do it again. Watch what happens. So, sound goes, bends back around, always trying to stay inside the slower medium. I'm going to do it one more time because I'm just so excited by this demo. Um, <laughs> it's, it's the absolute coolest. And I have to give it a huge shout out to the Physics Demo Lab folks who put this together. This demo does not exist anywhere else. So, thank you very much, guys. Where are we at here? Okay, so in case you didn't see it, this is more or less what happens. The, the, little, um, the little axle more or less goes up and down and stays in the center of the, uh, of the uh, slow material. And so, again, extremely special shout out to Monica, Nick, and Jim for helping put this all together. Cool. All righty. So let's go back to the ocean, right? So we saw, we made some intuitive sense as to how this works. Sound gets trapped in that middle layer. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff also happening, right? Because at different angles, you get different um, patterns going on here. And so instead of sticking to this little schematic here, let's actually use some real ocean data, or at least some more realistic ocean data. Um, and so if I do this in a simulation with uh, a realistic sound speed profile, what I wind up with is this, where I have the source on the top left corner in uh, red, and the sound is traveling uh, on these slow undulating waves like this. And so for scale, this is about 60 miles uh, edge to edge. Um, and so this, this channel here is called the SOFAR channel. Um, there is an acronym associated with that, but I'm pretty sure they just named it because sound travels so far uh, in this. Um, but to, to understand why sound travels so far in this, we have to go back to uh, spreading losses. And so the spreading losses, uh, we saw before, when it spreads out in a, in a hemisphere, we get that 1 over r squared dependence. And so what we see is 10 times the distance is 100 times quieter. But in this case now, we basically are dealing with a cylinder, where the cylinder is of a constant height, but it's spreading out in, in the radius. So what that means is, as sound travels farther and farther, it's trapped in one dimension. And so what that means is, now the loudness of scaling is 1 over r instead of 1 over r squared. And what that means is, at 10 times the distance, now it's only 10 times quieter instead of 100 times quieter. And this is, turns out to be really, really powerful uh, for getting sound to travel long distances. And so here's that plot again from before, uh, showing a firework and how uh, or well, rather, showing air and spherical spreading and how far it's able to travel. Um, and so for a firework, we see at 145 decibels, we get about 15 miles. That's where that blue line lands. But now let's redo this plot. Let's redo it with uh, ocean parameters. So that gets us um, the attenuation is much smaller, the little red chunk there. Um, and then we also have the spreading loss is now cylindrical instead of spherical. And what that means is that triangle, the orange wedge, now gets cut in half. And so that blue line indicating how far things travel goes much, much farther. And so what that means is for 145 decibel fireworks, sound now travels 20,000 miles. 20,000 miles instead of just 15 miles. That's phenomenal. And so for scale, that is the circumference of the Earth going all the way around 25,000 miles. So this is huge, huge distances that the sound is able to travel. Um, and so you can ask the question, all right, well, this sounds pretty good on paper, right? We understood, you know, the physics and... Uh, things of that nature, but all right, does this really happen? Um, can you actually go out into the ocean and measure this? Um, and so that is what the question was, um, and it was originally discovered during World War II in the mid to late 40s, but um, well, I'm going to fast forward to one of my favorite experiments, which is the Heard Island Feasibility Test done in 1991. Um, before I jump into the details there, I have to give a shout out to the people who actually did this experiment, um, two of which were University of Michigan professors, uh, Ted Birdsall and Kurt Metzger. Um, the other three associated with this were Walter Monk from the University of California at San Diego, um, Bob, I'm going to remember his last name, give me a moment, from the University of Washington, and Art Bagler at MIT. Um, maybe it will come to me. Maybe it won't. We'll see. Sorry, Bob. Um, <laughs> anyway, these are, these are the five people who organized this uh, awesome experiment. So, so first, we've got to ask the question, where is Heard Island? So let's jump to world map here. Um, Heard Island is that tiny little red dot down below. Um, and so to blow it up here, we've got the little yellow arrow. That is where Heard Island is located. And so what's so special about Heard Island is that if you draw straight lines out of it, you wind up traveling entirely by ocean and hitting the two sides of the US coast. 
The only problem is you can see these are not really straight lines, right? It looks like I just conveniently drew them in squiggles so that they would hit both sides of the coast. But in fact, they are straight lines. And so we can see here, we've got ourselves, got ourselves a globe as it's loading. Wait for it. Here we go. Get oriented. Okay, so here we are. And here is, there's India, and there is Heard Island down near uh, Antarctica, yeah? So here's Heard Island. If we broadcast sound, let's say, going this way, we just barely graze, so this is a straight line, just barely graze Africa and head up, um, and also just barely graze Brazil on the other side, and we're able to hit about Newfoundland. We can also hit Bermuda. So there's a pretty good spread there, traveling entirely by ocean, uh, going this way, and then if we go the opposite way, we go from sort of Antarctica, we just barely thread the needle between Australia and New Zealand, continue up and around, and we hit, well now it's upside down, but we hit the west coast of California and Washington State. So, um, the, this, these are legitimately straight lines. <laughs> I did not just conveniently draw them, so. Um, and so what that means is you'd expect that if you put sound sources down there, that sound will travel in straight lines um, around the world. And so that's what was done. Um, and so for scale here, this is 10,000 miles going one way, 9,000 miles the other way, and it's about 2,500 miles to the nearest airport. Um, so not, I do not envy the people who had to do this experiment, but it was really awesome uh, for me, <laughs> finding out after the fact. Um, okay, so this is, this is a picture of Heard Island uh, taken during the experiment. Um, it is an Antarctic island, um, and there are zero inhabitants, unless, of course, you count seals or penguins, uh, and then there's many inhabitants. Um, <laughs> And so, so they took uh, these gigantic speakers down there, 10 of these, 10 of these guys, 10 of these gigantic speakers down there, um, and broadcasted sound to see how far it would travel. And so here's what they predicted would happen. They said that if we broadcast sound from that point, then four hours later, either in Bermuda or in Washington State, what we would see is something that looks like this. These are what the arrival patterns would look like. And there's a lot of complicated structure here, um, but it, this is more or less the predicted values. And so when they actually did the experiment, this is what they measured. Just amazing agreement. So much, uh, it's, I, I wish my results in my thesis work looked this good. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, the conclusion here is that sound traveled halfway around the world and it did it twice, so I'm gonna count it as around the world. Um, so this is just super awesome that they were actually able to measure this. Um, and then further interesting is the experimental conditions that they had to do this under. So this is not legitimate video taken from back then, but um, this was uh, Beaufort 10 seas, for anyone who knows something about um, sea level. That is bad news. You do not want to be in that. So this, this is an example of that. This is what they were do facing constantly down there. And so of their 10 sources that they brought, they lost eight of them over the span of five days. So seven of them were just broke beyond repair. Um, but the eighth one, it actually broke off and is still sitting at the bottom of the Indian Ocean. <laughs> so anyway, and the experiment was supposed to last 10 days, so they had to quit after just five. Uh, so that's just absolutely crazy. I was actually born on that fifth day, so <laughs> hooray. Um, it's like it was meant to be. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, so this is all great, right? But you can't really go to funding agencies and be like, I want to take giant speakers and put them in the ocean really far away and listen, right? That's kind of hard to get funding that way. And so instead, you gotta, you gotta pitch them some applications, right? So here are some of the, some of the reasons why the SOFAR channel, or some of the effects of the SOFAR channel uh, throughout history. So in World War II, um, the SOFAR bomb was developed, which um, basically it was like a little explosion that would, uh, you would, you would drop it over the side of a ship if you were uh, downed in the middle of the ocean with no way to contact home. You would drop this little bomb and it would explode right at the sweet spot in that sound channel. And then thousands of miles away, people would be listening and they could triangulate where you were. And that would uh, potentially help save pilots' lives. Um, during the Cold War, there was the SOSIS array, which was designed to detect uh, Soviet submarines, which in the early part of the Cold War, they were very noisy and loud and uh, actually traveled in the sweet spot. But towards the later part of the Cold War, they made them quieter and stopped traveling there. <laughs> um, and then for tracking the effects of climate change more recently, uh, so that this is what Heard Island feasibility test was all about. For can we see what the uh, ocean temperatures, uh, have they changed over the years? And can we track that? Because right now we can track the surface temperature very easily with satellites, but not the bulk ocean temperature. And so this was a way uh, in which to do that. 
And then what's really cool is that this is also, uh, this, these are also effects that happen in the atmosphere. Um, and so in the Civil War, there was uh, some acoustic refraction that happened during the Battle of Gettysburg that you could make a fairly reasonable argument that the Battle of Gettysburg would have ended differently for the South um, had acoustic refraction not been a thing. Um, during the Cold War, um, Project Mogul was uh, created, super classified project to try and detect where uh, Soviet nuclear bombs were being detonated and how large they were. Um, turns out that this is also related to the Roswell incident uh, in New Mexico. Um, and then lastly, infrasound, uh, sound that's at lower frequency than humans can hear, but it's still there and detectable. Um, that is now presently used today to help figure out also where nuclear bombs are um, and how large they were. So just to recap here, we've, what we saw today is attenuation and spreading loss are the main things that limit how far sound can travel. Um, we saw that in the deep ocean, temperature and pressure changes lead to this fast, slow, fast pattern. Um, and that because of that, refraction takes over and changes spherical spreading into cylindrical spreading, which allows sound to travel much, much farther, you might even say so far, the name of the channel. Um, and from there, the Heard Island Feasibility Test to see if sound can travel around the world, and it infected. So I thank you very much, and I'm going to leave you with some terms to Google if you're interested, and some fun sites to check out if you like science communication. So thank you very much. Thank you <clears throat> very much, Brian. Brian gave a lot of credit to the demo staff, and they certainly deserve it. But this was Brian's idea, this demo, so I <laughs> you should know that. And finally, Chrissy uh, will be telling us about her work, uh, and the title is Entropy, Shape, and Phase Transitions. Can you guys hear? OK, that's all. Good. Um, Hi, um, thank you very much for still staying here and listening to my talk. Um, today I'm going to talk about entropy, shape, and phase transitions. So um, before I jump in, I want to like, talk a little bit about uh, what I do in the Glosser group. That basically, I use statistical mechanics to study, uh, design, study and design new mater materials. And uh, we're a purely computational lab, so the only like, experiments we ever do is involved with an air hockey table and a dryer. So if you want to know more about that, I can tell you afterwards. And here on the uh, left, it, you can just see like uh, computer simulations that I do with different like shapes of particles. And this is like kind of besides like plotting things, and this is the other way I show my research is just like to m try to make a lot of pretty movies. Okay, so um, go back to my title, and I want to start with talking about the third word um, in my title is phase transition. So what are phase transitions? And this is a definition I got from Wikipedia, basically talking about transitions um, between solid, liquid, and gas states of matter sometime in plasma. Uh, I really like this definition, and uh, so, but it's still right, right now very abstract. So basically, I want to start with um, some like real life examples. So the first one I want to say is uh, super cooled water. Okay, okay, so. Um, water's not here yet, but um, basically, uh, what are super cool water? This is actually something you guys can experience like every winter in Michigan. So <laughs> basically what happened is that uh, one, one morning, I think like a very cold day, I left half a bottle of spring water in my car. And while I was driving and waiting for a red light, I was really bored, so I just turned that water backwards. And then the next thing I know is I have a bottle of solid. Like the water just freeze into ice. So here you can just see this like happening in real life. And hopefully I can have actually a bottle here to show you the whole thing happens. So what happens here is like during the night that the temperature drop from below freezing to under freezing, but since it actually happened really slow, um, that the water still stayed in liquid form, but with any sort of perturbation here, you see there's like a ice putting into a glass that the water would just actually freeze. So here we have a phase transition of liquid to solid. And another thing that um, people kind of always talk about is like heating a magnet. And here I'm basically going to show you a demo of um, that by heating a magnet here that it actually will demagnetize and then this nail is going to drop. Okay, so to start that, I need to prepare myself because I need to play with fire. <laughs> and 
and put on goggles. Cool. <coughs> yes. Let's do this. Yeah, this is going to take a while. Yep. So basically, you can see like this actually happened instantaneously. And if like the temperature just dropped a little bit, like right now, I'm going to try to put it, get it. See, it actually like goes back very fast. OK. So here, that we have basically from magnetized to demagnetized. And these are like, here I showed you two examples that are uh, phase transitions that is driven by temperature. So there's like other things that can drive a phase transition also. Here is the temperature, like same thing, just like someone else did it. And then you can also use magnetic field. So if you're here like last week, um, there was one demo showing that how you can have a ferrofluid that basically it's in a fluid form, but if you put a magnet under it, it's actually going to alter into some kind of structure. And then there also like pressure can also drive phase transitions. This is actually one of my favorite examples here. You have a piece of uh, graphite. And we all know this graphite is like made of like carbon atoms. And then, but if you apply a lot of pressures on it, and you are going to get a diamond. And um, diamond is also only made of carbon atoms. And the only difference between these two um, materials are that uh, this is the uh, st structures of graphite, and this is the structure of diamond. And just like because here we're having like a phase transition that is from going from one kind of crystal structure to another kind, and by this kind of um, from you can say crystal to crystal transition or solid to solid transition that um, we change the material um, property dramatically. So here I want to make a claim that says that entropy can also drive phase transitions. So we're moving to the second term in my title. So what is entropy? Um, this is the only question I'm going to show in this whole talk. So here it says like, OK, entropy S is equals to this um, constant um, times a log of W. So what is W? So I'm going to put it here is like I, I define W in ways. And so this, like if you look at the definition of entropy on Wikipedia, you would kind of say that entropy is a measure of like how random or how disordered a system is. So I don't personally like that um, definition. It's like one-sided. So I would more like want to say that um, entropy equals options. So the reason for that is, so for example, like everyone is sitting in this room right now. So imagine that we don't have seats. So there's like man, many ways people can be like, and for example, everyone might just want to be in like one corner. So there like, it's like everyone is kind of random, like they don't have, like is, there's no ordering it, but you're all stuck in that corner. Like it's very uncomfortable, everyone kind of jammed. There's like almost only one way to be stuck in that corner. But if everyone is like actually just sitting in like this kind of orderly fashion by all the different uh, chairs, um, they all have like some room you can move around. And by moving around a little bit, like you, you, get, you have more options basically in that way. So that's why I want to say like entropy equals options. And sometimes if you are in some kind of other form that gives you more options, that is actually something entropy wants the system to do. So I will start with showing you that I, I will say entropy can other spheres. So I'm going to do a demo here. I have, so apologies, this is really loud. So I have um, a bottle of like just steel spheres. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to shake it a little bit. can see that I did not do any magic here. Just like by shaking it, they all form into this pattern very neatly. And similarly, we can do this in a computer simulation. So here, I just have a, um, a box of spheres, like this is a computer simulation, and you can see that by just like kind of doing this shaking motion in the computer, it starts to order. 
And basically, it goes from this red where it, you see it's jammed and they're in like some kind of this other state to what we, call, we can call liquid state to this state that um, where everything inside like neatly pattern is, this is exactly the same pattern I just showed you um, on the camera. And basically, changing to this other, like we call solid state. And here, even though they're in an order, you can see there's like a lot of like room around themselves that they can move freely locally. So what, um, like why this like matters to us is that, yeah, so from spheres that this are like all the atoms, like that's what their shape is. But if you kind of zoom out a little bit and to think about materials or like particles that people can make in the lab now on like from 10 nanometers to like one micron. So they actually can make a lot of different shapes particles. And for example, um, my favorite ones are this like faceted polyhedra. So you can basically grow a shape in a cube or a tetrahedron and all that kind of different things. And in fact, they will actually, unlike the pattern that sphere just formed, they will form um, different um, different patterns. And here I'm going to show you how like octahedra will form in real life. Okay, so here I have like a cup of 3D printed octahedra. I'm going to empty this. Okay. And put the octahedra in this bottle. Do the same shaking motion. Okay. You see, like they form something like different compared to the spheres, but it's still ordered. I didn't do anything like special here. You can all come play with it like afterwards. <laughs> So like, so 3D printing, this, those shapes are like really hard in the sense that, so we printed a lot of those like uh, octahedras and then they don't want to print anything more for us anymore because they're really tiny. So, and they're like, they're charged by how much material they're used. But uh, we can do all this like very freely in like a computer. We can study like a bunch of different shapes. So in a study in our group in 2012, we look at this like 145 shapes and study what kind of structure they will form. And here are like some, um, close-up examples. So on the left, you, can, you have diamonds. So this is exactly the same structure that how carbon forms. But instead of carbon atoms here, we have this like building block that is this uh, slightly truncated octahedra. And then there's like uh, another shape that will form a structure that is like similar to lithium. And there are some other examples. And if you see the one in the left corner, it's um, the shape is called the dihedral. I have one here, same one. And it actually forms um, the same structure as uh, mag the material magnesium does. So these are all just like a bunch of different shapes. They form different structures. So basically, how do we tie the story together? How can we like talk about shape entropy and phase transition in all the same sentence? So basically, start from starting, we have like, sh if we have shapes, and then entropy will make this shape form different structures, and this is uh, liquid to solid or disorder to other phase transition. But if we can change shapes, that basically by using entropy, so we will have a structural transformation. So if I have spheres, and I, by some way, I change them to octahedra, so basically I need to go from one structure that sphere form to the structure octahedra forms. So similarly to how graph and diamond goes, now we have a phase transition between one type of solid to another type of solid. So um, now I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about like my own research and what kind of, I'm studying this like solid A to solid B phase transitions. So here are the structures I use. Um, so let's go from the right, that's from like the easy structure, it's called simple cubic structure. So basically imagine like you have a cube and you're putting an atom. Here I have like the atom for me is a truncated cube on the, each of the vertices. And then in the center, this blue face uh, is body center cubic. So instead of putting a particle all on like the vertices, you also put one in the middle. And then, so that, that is actually also the structure that octahedral will want to form. So 
the one on the left, you have um, this red face is face center cubic. It's what spheres will want to form. And the difference here is instead of having one particle in the center, you have a, a particle on the center of each face. And if you see here, this red particle and the blue particle, like from where you're sitting, they probably look exactly the same. And you might think I just made them look different because I colored them differently. So there's actually like a small um, difference between like one of the short um, edge lenses on the red particle. You see that one is more or less visible while the blue one is not. So that's the only shape difference those two um, polyhedrons has and that will actually cause them to form into different structures. Okay, so but I can also play with this in a computer simulation. So let's say I start with a shape that forms the BCC structure, the blue face, and then I change, I drastically change that shape into uh, of, uh, something that forms the red face. And here you can just see in this simulation that the blue structure goes to the red structure very fast. So, and so basically I want to kind of study the properties of how this phase transition happens. And when we talk about phase transitions, there's like two different kinds. There is this continuous phase transition and continuous phase transition. And you can study them basically by just like plotting some kind of function like pressure for me, like pressure versus like the shapes changing I'm using. And if there, you see a discontinuity, that then it's a discontinuous tr transition. If everything is, looks fine, it's continuous, then it's a continuous phase transition. So the like for example, this super cool water from like um, liquid to solid, it is a discontinuous transition. And while this heating magnet, this transition is continuous. So basically, these are like the, all the shapes I look at, and I detect like six um, places that have this uh, phase transition happen. So the structures. So first, um, I'm going to look at um, the BCC to the blue to red phase phase transition, and here I'm plotting pressure as a function of the uh, shape parameters I'm using illustrated up there, and we can already see that there is a discontinuity here. That the pressure there's a pressure jump between when you go from the red phase to the blue phase. And another thing to notice here is that there's this region where the red phase is still stable while you see the blue phase clearly have a lower pressure. So this is exactly similar to how this um, super cool water is where that even though um, the, the ice is a more stable phase, but because um, this is discontinuous that the liquid phase is still can be metastable there. It will only change into ice when you perturb it. So for the BCC to simple cubic case, um, case where we can see that there is no real discontinuity, so this is like similar to the demagnetization where like when you get to the right temperature, it will just happen. Okay, so what we have learned today, that first we learned that um, entropy can drive phase transitions by showing how like spheres can order and then changing um, building block shapes, we can translate between like two solid, trans solid structures similar to the one I showed, and then there are like different kinds of phase transitions in nature. So now I want to thank everyone's attention and thank, I want to thank the um, Gosser group and all my funding resources to support me doing this research. And again, special thanks to the physics demo lab without them like this cannot happen, so. Mm -hmm.